Welcome to the Christian Men at Work podcast, where I interview men from all walks of life with varying job titles who have one thing in common. They are all choosing daily to live out their Christian faith through their work, and because of that, they are leading, prospering, glorifying God, and experiencing joy and purpose in their work, and you can too. Welcome, Men at Work, to episode 25. Before we get to our interview, I want to ask you a favor. I've been accepted into the Colson Fellows 10-month entrepreneurial discipleship program. It starts on July 1st. Between tuition and travel and book expenses, this will cost around $1,500. I've created a GoFundMe account to pay for this cost at gofundme.com slash colson fellows dash tuition. I'm really excited about it, and I feel it will be a critical step for me to clarify my Christian worldview, improve my ability to impact our culture and disciple others, and help me define a mission for the rest of my life, or at least the short term, um, which would include this ministry and this podcast. Since I started ministering to men around issues of faith and work with my blog in 2011, Uh, writing and publishing my book, Jesus is at Work, in 2014, and publishing this podcast in 2016, my family has paid for all the costs associated with those activities, which have frankly been upwards of $10,000 over these years, with essentially no income, and I haven't asked for donations. Though I could find a way to pay for this discipleship program, I would prefer to not to ask my family to pay for this, and so I am humbling myself and asking for your financial support. I will provide a link for this GoFundMe account on my website, davehilgendorf.com, in the notes for this episode on my youtube.com slash davehilgendorf channel, as well as on my Dave H. Author Twitter and Facebook pages. Hugh Welchel is my guest today, and I'm really excited about this interview. He is the executive director of the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, a nonprofit he funded six years ago committed to advancing biblical and economic principles that help individuals find fulfillment in their work and contribute to a free and flourishing society. Over 30 years, Hugh's unique career as a senior executive in the business world has given him the opportunity to work in a number of industries, including IT and higher education. In addition to his business acumen, Hugh has a passion and expertise in helping individuals integrate their faith and vocational calling. He's the author of How Then Should We Work? Rediscovering the Biblical Doctrine of Work, released in May of 2012. He has also served as both the executive director and board member of the Fellows Initiative, a coalition of postgraduate Christian leadership development programs established in key communities around the nation. On the topic of faith and work, Hugh is frequently called upon to teach and speak on the radio at conferences, churches, seminaries, business groups, and universities around the nation. He is a contributor to the Washington Post on Faith Local Leaders website and has been published on the gospelcoalition.org and by faith online. He's also been a guest on Moody Radio Networks in the Market with Janet Parshell, Salem Radio Network, IRN USA Radio Network, and Truth That Transforms, among other shows. A native Floridian, Hugh graduated from the University of Florida and earned a master's degree in theology from Reformed Theological Seminary before moving to Northern Virginia 13 years ago. He serves as an ordained ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church in America. He serves in leadership at McLean Presbyterian Church in McLean, Virginia, and also serves on the boards of several Christian nonprofit organizations. In what little spare time he has, Hugh enjoys hiking golf and restoring old sports cars. I've gotten to know Hugh a little bit uh, over the last few years. I met him through uh, some men's conferences in the D.C. area and uh, got to know him a lot better through this interview. So I'm really excited about this. Let's get right to our interview. Hugh, thanks a lot for joining the call today. My first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about when and how you became a Christian? 
Yes, I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on. I'm, I'm really excited about the interview today. So, yeah, I tell you, I was very fortunate in the fact that I grew up in a very committed Christian family. My mother and father were deep believers, and I can truly say I never knew a day that I did not know about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And I grew up in the church, was very involved in, in a youth work in high school and in college. Um, and so I just, I, like I said, it was a very, very um, um, excellent childhood. Well, that's great. Uh, let's jump ahead to your career before we kind of get into some, uh, some other things. Can you give us kind of a quick overview of your career, uh, some of the industries you've been in, some of the positions you've held, and uh, you know, maybe maybe along the way, tell us about what maybe what was your favorite uh, favorite job or industry that you were involved in. Yeah, I, I've I've done a whole lot of different things over the years. Uh, the first job I had out of college was actually one of my favorite jobs. I worked in the environmental industry. Got with some guys that just started a company the year before I joined. They did about a million dollars in sales the year before I came on board. I was really kind of their first outside hire, and um, we did almost $50 million in sales, um, or got up to $50 million in sales in about six years. So I tell people going from a million to 50 million, I, I really learned a tremendous amount about business during that period of time and how to uh, start new offices, train people and hire people. It was one of the most incredible experiences I've had. And then Worked, I went from there, I owned a construction company for a little while, you know, installing environmental equipment. I didn't particularly like that too much. Uh, sold that company, um, got with some guys that were starting a training company in the IT uh, industry. And this was in the very, very early stages of, of the IT industry. This is before there was email. The Internet was, was just brand new. Very few people even understood or used the Internet. And we uh, got with some guys and started a company and began to train um, computer engineers. Uh, um, it was really very exciting. Worked for Microsoft uh, as, as part of their training arm. And I can remember when Microsoft rolled out the first version of Outlook. That shows how long ago it was. So uh, very exciting. Was in that business for about uh, 15 years on uh, several different companies. I uh, got out of that and actually stepped out of the business world for seven years and ran a seminary. Uh, there was a seminary called Reformed Theological Seminary. It had a campus in Washington, D.C., which is where I was living at the time, and they asked me if I would step in and help them get that uh, organization back up tr on track. And I'll be honest with you, for academics to come ask a business guy to help them, you know they had to really be desperate, and they were really desperate. The um, the, uh, this particular campus was really struggling. In fact, all practical purposes was about to go under. And I thought, well, I'll do this for a year or two while I look for a real job. But by God, in God's grace and his timing, I ended up doing it for seven years. And we got it back on track and got it going again. And then I stepped out of that about six years ago to start the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. I'd never really been involved in a nonprofit uh, or, or done any work really in the nonprofit world before. And so it's been quite an education over the last six years, uh, um, starting the Institute and, and doing some of the work we've done. So it's been, uh, it's been many, many varied uh, different things. Uh, I started my first company in college. I, I put myself through college. My dad told me if I paid for my own college, I'd appreciate it more. Uh, he paid for my sisters, so I guess they didn't appreciate it as much as I did. But um, I started my first company uh, in, in the summers. I was a pilot. I, ha I had a pilot's license. I got a pilot's license when I was 16. And I started a crop dusting business. And I would uh, go up to, I was going to school in Florida. I would go up to South Georgia and I would crop dust all summer and make enough money to put myself through school the following year. So um, many different, uh, many different companies, many different uh, uh, um, industries. It's been very exciting. I've heard a lot about a lot of ways of people paying their way through college, but I have to say it's the first time I've heard of crop dusting. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a tad dangerous, and about um, in about five, I guess I did it for almost five years, I wrecked two airplanes and, and walked away from them. So I tell a lot of people it's God's providence that he protected me during those period, that period of time. For sure, for sure. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. So what led you to go from what you were doing before that um, with the seminary 
to to form this foundation kind of what what were the factors what was going on in your life what what kind of experiences made you decide this is something I want to do yeah I tell you you really have to kind of go back to about 1990 I was down in Florida running computer companies and I really began to have kind of a crisis in faith around faith and work interestingly enough I really began to wonder why doesn't God care about what I do every day? If you'd asked me back then, Hugh, what do you do that's important? I would have told you, well, I, um, if, if for God, what I do important for God, I would have told you, I work um, in my church. I, I, I'm an elder in my church. I teach adult Sunday school. I, I work with two or three. I'm on boards with two or three a nonprofit uh, a Christian organizations. Um, but I never would have said, in a million years, I never would have said, I run a computer company to the glory of God. That was not in my mindset at all. In fact, I was stuck in, in the same place a lot of people are today. I thought some things in my life were spiritual and some things in my life were secular. And I thought my work that I did for Monday through right was secular, and God really didn't care about that. But the more I thought about that, the more I thought, you know, there's got to be something wrong with this picture. And I went to my pastor, and he said, well, Hugh, God's just giving you the ability to make money so that you can bring it to the church so we can do good things with it. And I thought, you know, that can't be quite right. And so I was really kind of struggling with this, and there were a couple of friends of mine in my church that were professors at a seminary uh, there in Orlando called Reformed Theological Seminary. And they said, well, you, you ought to come take some classes at seminary. And I thought, well, I don't know if I want to do or not, that or not, but it was literally the campus was across the street from my office. So I started going over there and taking classes at night, and interesting enough, very quickly found out that seminaries didn't understand the faith and work uh, issue either. Uh, but I started taking some classes and started reading some stuff by people like Francis Schaeffer and Abraham Kuyper, and, and they kind of led me back to people like Martin Luther in the Reformation and John Calvin, who wrote all about faith and work. In fact, Martin Luther said the work of the milkmaid is just as important to God as the work of the priest. That was heresy in his day. It's still heresy in a lot of churches today. And the more I read, uh, really in church history, the more I began to discover this incredible um, theology of work that comes right out of the scriptures. And I really, I just really couldn't believe uh, that the church hadn't talked about that. I thought, you know, I've been in the church all my life. I've never heard any of this. And the reality is the church has kind of lost this important view of the importance of, of everyday work uh, over the last about 100 years. So it's really kind of out of that that I kind of got into the faith and work movement and, and have watched over the years as the movement has slowly developed and, and there have been more and more books written. Uh, I actually uh, ended up getting a degree in seminary and did my master's thesis on faith and work. Um, the interesting thing, I couldn't find anybody in the seminary to be my advisor because they just really didn't see the importance in it. Um, but finally found somebody and, and went ahead and did it. And like I said, kind of been watching and, and kind of being on the outskirts of the faith and work um, arena. And then uh, after uh, the seven years in the seminary, one of the things I was frustrated about is the seminaries really don't care and don't teach much about faith and work and was really um, kind of frustrated in trying to get them to include more of the ideas of faith and work in some of the curriculum that they were using. So finally, I decided to start a nonprofit around faith and work because I really felt like there were some things that uh, I had discovered on my own and some things that I had uh, talked with other people about and learned um, that could be added to some of the things that were going on in the faith and work uh, arena already. And so we started the Institute about six years ago because we thought we could have a really positive influence, not only on the overall movement, but we could begin to help spread this deeper understanding that God really cares about what you do every day, whether you're a dishwasher or you're running a Fortune 500 company or you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a guy working on a spreadsheet in a financial house every day, that, that your work is still significant and there's intrinsic value in the things that you ever do every day. So um, that's kind of, I mean, it's a long answer to, to a short question, but it kind of uh, helps frame why I did this and, and why I thought it was so important. That's helpful, and it's, it is interesting, uh, some of the history behind that, and, and it, and because, um, you know, I'm, I'm sold on the idea of that this being important, of course, and it's where we spend almost all our time, um, but it, it's just interesting that it hasn't 
the that your experience was it just hasn't been a focus within the church uh leadership and and training um That's right so thanks for the, yeah thanks for that perspective so that gives us a good idea of kind of your maybe your motive motivate some of your motivation uh, talk about the actual process of forming this foundation and tell us yeah. a little bit about what what how it's evolved and what it's involved in today sure, sure. What we wanted to do, we wanted to start an institute that really produced um, uh, really excellent materials around faith and work that could be shared with other organizations, that could be shared with churches. Um, and one of the things that I thought, you know, who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, another guy. I'm not, certainly no expert on this. So what we decided to do is start the organization. We, we hired a, a Ph.D. in theology and Ph.D. in economics were the first two people we hired. Uh, to work with me, and what we begin to do is reach out to uh, um, experts, some of the greatest minds in Christendom uh, currently, that, that had some understanding about faith and work and economics, and, and how those three things fit together. And we actually raised some money and, and began to uh, uh, have a lot of people uh, do research papers for us. Now, the interesting thing, we, we had some incredible research done but most people aren't going to read research papers. So the idea behind the Institute was to really do the research, get the best minds in Christendom to give us their ideas and, 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 and really tell us what the Bible says about faith, work, and economics. Then take that research and translate it into things that people like you and I will read, right? So we started writing small books and um, we do a blog five days a week about faith and work and, and really, it goes out at 6 o'clock in the morning to try to encourage people as they're going to work to think about these things from the Scripture that apply to what they're going to do that day. And then we did, we did videos, and we've done a curriculum of Bible studies and a homeschool curriculum. So we've, we've done all sorts of different products that we sell on our, at our store, and, and we kind of push out through all sorts of different channels to try to influence uh, people around these ideas about faith, work, and economics. So it's been really, it's been a, it's been a challenge. It's been a very fruitful work, I think, and and I think we're slowly but surely starting to move the needle. We have about last year we had about two million unique visitors come to our website. We have about I know somewhere between forty five fifty thousand people read our blog every day. So slowly but surely we're, we're making uh, some inroads, and then we decided we really want to focus on uh, kind of four different areas. Kind of the first is kind of a more general outreach through our website, through some of our books. And then more specifically, we do a lot of work with pastors. We do a lot of work with business leaders, and we do a lot of work with um, educators, uh, trying to help them think through some of these issues because all three of those groups have a very large sphere of influence. So we want to influence the influencers. So, so we've been doing this for about six years now. And uh, like I said, uh, really believe that some of the things that we talk about a lot, especially around economics and flourishing and these ideas uh, that really weren't being talked about a whole lot, even six years ago, are, are starting to take traction and more and more people talking about it. So I think God's been very gracious with us and, and has really helped us because, to be honest with you, we really didn't know what we were doing when we first got started. Yeah, I guess that's true of every everyone that starts something new. Um, yeah, I was reading through uh, one of your uh, e-books, uh, Monday Morning Success, yes. and you made, a state, you made a statement in there I wanted to ask you about. You said that the American dream, which includes, among other things, the idea that you can do anything you want and be the very best at something, is actually a lie. And you, then you ex go on to explain why, and you use the parable of the talents to, to explain why it's a lie. Can you, can you talk to us about that? Sure, sure, sure. I tell people that, you know, unfortunately, and this is true with your audience today, unfortunately, most of you have been told two great lies. And those lies have been told to you by your school teachers, by some, even by your Sunday school teachers. Uh, but the two great lies are specifically this. The first one is that you can be anything that you want to be. And, and really, that's just, that's just not true. I'll give you an example. I uh, played football in high school. I was a big kid. This is back, I tell people, in the last century, I graduated from high school in 1970, 
And I wanted to play college, big time college football. I was six four, about two hundred and forty pounds, and wanted to be a tight end. And back then, that was the size of, of even tight ends playing in the NFL. So I was big enough and strong enough and uh and I was pretty quick. I had good hands, you know, I could catch the ball really well. Uh I got up to uh to the university and tried to walk on and quickly realized while I was quick, they were fast. And it didn't matter that I was the same size that they were. Those guys were a lot faster than I was. And not only would I never play NFL football, I was not even going to play college football. And so to say you could be anything you want to be, that's just, that's just not true. You know, and there are a few exceptional people that God gives the gifts and the skills that go on and, and, and play football at a higher level like that. But it, I quickly realized I wasn't one of them. So this idea that we could be anything we want to be, it's just, it's just not true. And um, I was on a radio show uh, not too long ago, and I was talking to, to, to them about this specific thing. And they said, you know, well, give, us, give us an example. I said, well, you know, I go to a grocery store. In fact, this woman actually called in to the radio. And she said, no, no, it's true. You can't be anything you want to be. And, and one of the things I'd said in the radio program is, you know, we, we say in the United States, you know, anybody can grow up to be president. I just said, that's just not true. That's just absolutely not true. And she called in this and said, oh, no, no, that is true. That is true. And I said, no, think about this for a second. I go to a grocery store, and I really like the fact that, the, that whoever runs the grocery store has hired a couple of young men to bag groceries. And, and, and when you talk to these young men, they obviously have some handicaps, and, and, and it comes across. But, but these, guys, these guys are, I mean, they're, they're so neat that they're there, they're working hard, and they're really polite, and they want to bag your groceries and take them out for you and everything. And I told her, you know, it, 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 it's really cool to see that they're given an opportunity to do good work, right? But the reality is neither one of those young men are ever going to be a, grow up to be president. I said, you know, uh, that anyone can grow up to be president really only applies to someone like you. I was talking to a woman on the radio. I said, who's, uh, who's smart and, 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 and fairly well off? And she got mad, hung up. Um, I was never invited on the radio show again, so I have to be careful what I say from now on. But, but it's really true. Um, this idea that anyone can grow up to be anything they want is just absolutely not true. The second great lie is almost as bad as the first, and it's caused tremendous amount of damage, particularly in the millennial generation. And the second great lie is you can be the best in the world. And that's just absolutely not true. In fact, if you look at the parable of talents, I would suggest the parable of talents is all about what is the biblical meaning of success. When I was a businessman, I struggled with that because I never heard in the church what success was like. I would hear sermons about contentment. You learn, you, and the pastor would say, you need to learn how to be content. And I would walk out and I'd say, pastor, does that mean tomorrow when I go to work, I don't really try hard to win that new contract so I can expand my business and hire more people? And he goes, oh, no, 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 that's not what I was talking about. I said, but that's exactly what you said. And he said, no, I'm talking about spiritual things. You're talking about secular things. Well, see, I've come to realize that everything is spiritual. There is no secular for the Christian. And the reality is we have to understand, particularly those of us who are working in the business world, what is a biblical version of success? What does success look like from the Bible? And I think the truth is told uh, to this, or the answer to this uh, question is found in the parable of talents. You know, the parable of the talents is a very familiar parable. We all know it. You know, the guy gets ready to go on a journey, brings in three of his servants. He gives one, one talent, one, two talents, one, five talents. And then he goes away. And two of the servants invest them wisely. They, they take the resources the master gave them. They take them into the marketplace, and they, they, and they earn a return for the master. The other one just buries his talent in the ground. The guy got one talent, buries his talent in the ground. Well, I used to think, you know, um, that, you know, the guy with one talent, after, after all, he didn't have very much. And when the master comes back, the master is really upset with him. And I thought, man, that master's being awful harsh on this guy. All he had was one crummy little talent. And I'm thinking, you know, this talent is one little coin, right? Well, I did a study one time to see what a talent's worth in today's uh, dollars. And one talent in that story is worth somewhere between a million and two and a half million dollars in today's dollars. So the guy that got one talent took $2 million and buried it in the backyard. No wonder the master was upset with him. But here's even a more surprising thing. 
the guy that got five talents, he got ten million dollars and went out to the marketplace and made ten million more dollars. Now that would be significant even if you did it today. But back then, that and particularly in their culture, I mean, this guy was like a Steve Jobs or or a you know, I mean, he was just a brilliant businessman. Even the guy with two talents, you know, he took four million, went out and made four million more. Well, that's pretty significant. But here's the interesting thing about the parable of talents. And I believe if the guy with one talent had worked hard and taken his money and invested it and, and, and used it uh, appropriately, he would have gotten a return for the master as, as well. But he chose not to. He didn't want to take any chances. The reality is he didn't want to work, right? Because the guys who made the return on the investment the master made in them, they had to go out and work hard. And this is the real, I think this is the real secret to this, this parable. It says that the, at the very beginning, it says that the master gave one five talents, one two talents, one one talent, each according to his own ability. Now, if we did that, we wrote that story today, we couldn't do that. Everybody get upset and said, no, 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 you got to give everybody, you know, three and a half talents. Everybody has to get the same. Everything has to be equal. But see, the master knew that the five-talent guy was a better business guy than the two-talent guy or the one-talent guy, so he gave him more. Now, here's the interesting thing. At the end of that parable, look at the reward that the five-talent guy gets. He gives the master back the money and, and the money he made, and the master says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. You, you've been... Uh, faithful over a little, I'll make you faithful over much. Then the two-talent guy comes. He gives the two talents back and then the two talents that he made. And what does the master tell him? The exact same thing. The reward is exactly the same. Well done, my good faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. I, you've been faithful over a little, I'll make you faithful over much. Now, wait a minute. What's wrong with this picture? See, today, who would we hold up on a pedestal? We'd hold up the five-talent guy, right? He would be one we'd all want to be like. He would be the one that would be living in the big house and driving the big fancy car, right? But see, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't reward on how much money you make or how successful you are. God works on uh, rewards on how much work you do for the master, how you do your work. Here's the trick, and really the secret of understanding this parable. How hard did the guy that got five talents, how hard did he have to work to make five talents more? He had to work as hard as he could. How hard did the guy that took two talents and made two more talents, how hard did he have to work? He had to work as hard as he could. And I would argue that if the one talent guy had done what God wanted him to and gone out and worked hard, he would have made the same type of return and would have got the exact same reward. See, God rewards us. We're taking what he's given us, using it with the opportunities that he presents to bring a return on the investment that he's made on us back to the master. And all we have to do is faithfully work as hard as we can at what God's called us to do using the resources that he's given us, and we will be rewarded the same. We'll all find the ultimate reward. We all hear well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. And that is really the secret of success. The biblical secret of success is pretty simple. It's to take the, the opportunities that you have, use all the resources God has given you, and maximize the return on the master. Do, it, do the best job you possibly can do. And the outcome is not as important as the way that you work. Does that make sense? It does. I was just thinking, I mean, there's a couple of things uh, to get the most out of that truth that you've been sharing. One of them is to really get, really believe in our heart that that is God's heart, that, that he, he's interested in what we're going to do regardless of what we've been given. If we could be convinced of that, that would be huge. And then the second thing is to make that our primary focus. But I think where so many of us, um, all of us to some degree, get trapped is we don't just think about what God thinks. We 
compare ourselves to the other person at work or the pro athlete and we think That's about right. what people we think about what people think about us and so i mean how, how do how do we how do we shift that thinking and try to not think so much about comparing ourselves to somebody else and just think about doing the best with what we've got yeah i think part of it part of it comes with this this it, we first time i have to understand those two lies, right? And realize those are lies. You can't be the best in the world. So you can't compare yourself to someone that's a lot better. It's funny. I, uh, that, the little booklet you were talking about, I sent it to a friend of mine who's an attorney. And he wrote back to me after reading. He said, this blessed me more than anything I've read in a long time. He said, you know, I'm an attorney. And he said, no matter how hard I worked, I would look at other attorneys that were just so much better than I was. They were so much smarter. They were just you know, these guys, some of them were just brilliant, and, and I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. And he said, I always felt like a failure because I never thought I could measure up to them, right? And he says, when I read this, I realized that's not the measure. The measure is how well are I doing based on what God has called me to do? Am I doing the things he's called me to do? So the focus has to be off other people, right, and, and, and turn toward us, understanding what has God called me to do, and how can I go out and do that to the best of my ability? That's, and, 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 you know, obviously in our culture, that's incredibly difficult because our whole culture, advertising, everything is built around comparing yourself to others. And you want to be like that cool person, or you want to be like the person that's got a lot of money, or the person that's really smart, or, or you know, on and on and on. And see, what you have to understand is, first of all, you can't do that, but you don't get a free pass either. You're going to be hold to, held to a different standard. You're going to be held to God's standard, and God's standard is he expects you to do what he's called you to do to the best of your ability. That's the standard we're all going to be held to. And this is not works. This is not work salvation. This is not you know working to prove I'm saved or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. It's once we become believers, once we are drawn in covenant relationship with, with, with God through his son, Jesus Christ, and because of what he did, it, it, is, it is he, it is Jesus, who brings us into this covenant relation and restores our relationship with God the Father. I, I, yeah, I just, wanted to, I, I just wanted to say how helpful that is for me. I mean, because um, I, I know I'll just be, be transparent for myself. I mean, I've. Uh, I wasn't the smartest guy, um, uh, you know, getting my engineering degree, and and it's so easy to compare yourself to others. And I think, especially when you kind of get midway through your career, you start saying, you know, am I going to be able to achieve whatever that milestone is, you know, within your right. sphere of influence? And if and if and it, and if you if you honestly aren't sure, if you say you can't, you know, somehow that can be really defeating. But uh, I, I've never thought about the, the parable in that way, and that's really helpful. So thanks for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. And, and like I said, you know, it, it's, not, it's not working for your salvation, right? It, it's being obedient to the calling that God has placed on your life. Our motivation is not to prove ourselves. Our motivation is our love for what Christ has done for us. The sacrifice he's made for us, it should propel the love that we have for him we should want to go out and do what he's called us to do. See, so it's not a, you know, I hear a lot of people push back to, oh, you're just talking about, you know, you're trying to prove your salvation. No, my salvation was brought to me by Jesus and, and, and by Christ and Christ alone. But what I'm doing is I'm living in the covenant, and the covenant has responsibilities, and I'm being faithful to the responsibilities of life in the covenant with God. And that's something I should want to do. I should be motivated to do that because of my love for Christ, because of what he's done for me. Let, let's talk about that whole issue of calling for a minute. And I read um, in, uh, in your book where you quote uh, Eric Liddell from who yes. was in the, he was the, the focus of the movie Chariots of Fire. He was an Olympic runner and he's famous for saying, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Yes. What yes, would you right. what, what what would you say to our listeners who struggle maybe with um, they're not sure if they're doing exactly what God called them to be 
And yes. maybe an, another part of that is they don't maybe feel God's pleasure every day at their work. Maybe yeah, maybe they right. feel something a little bit a little bit less than that. Well, and, and really to understand why that's true, you have to go back to the book of Genesis, right? So you go back to Genesis three, and what happens in Genesis three? We, we remember the story of the Garden of Eden and then the apple and the snake and Adam and Eve fall out of grace. They they sin. They don't do what God told them. I mean, they did what God told them not to do, uh, eating from the, from the and God curses our work because of our sin. So we have to understand Genesis 15, 316 talks about the curse that's on work. Now, see, work is not part of the curse, but work is cursed because of sin. That's a very important thing. I hear people all the time saying, well, you know, when we get to heaven, we won't. Well, it's not true. We will have work to do in heaven, and it will be great work. Because it'll be it'll be work that won't be under the the curse of sin. So the reason our work is hard, in fact, it says this in the scripture that your work will be hard. You know, we'll we'll earn the bread uh, that we eat by the sweat of our brow. It's hard because of the curse of sin that is in this current world. When we live in the new heaven and new earth, and the curse has been completely removed, work will be incredibly easy. In fact. If you think about the best two minutes of work that you can that you can remember, everything was perfect. You were on; it was easy. You were just getting incredible things done. If you think about that two minutes, every minute, in every hour, in every day for eternity, will be like that when we work in the new heaven and the new earth. So that's what we have to look forward to. Now. The reason that it's not always like that is because of the curse of sin. And so we have to expect that work is going to be hard. But what God does is once in a while, he gives us a taste of what work is supposed to be like. And I think when Eric Little says, I feel his pleasure when I run, what he's saying in there is that for a split second when he's running, He feels the pleasure of God because he's doing what God intended him to do. And and it's good work, and it's positive work. And so God gives him a taste of what all of his work will be like in the new heaven and new earth. And I I talk to people all the time and say, Hugh, you know, I just, I've got a terrible job, you know, and and there's all these things wrong with it. And, you know, I I tell them, look, I started my own company. I I invented the company. I, I made up my own job. This should be the perfect job for me. But yet there are a lot of things that I go and have to do at work that I don't like doing. And and some of them I struggle with. And some of them, times when I do it, it's really, really hard. See, on this side of heaven, there's no perfect jobs. And people need to get that out of their head. Everybody's looking for the perfect job. There are no perfect jobs because we're always going to work under the curse in in this world. So I think when Eric Little says that, uh, you know, he's really – He's tasting something all of us have experienced once in a while. And, uh, and it's a glimpse of what God has in store for us for eternity. Now, let me talk about calling a little bit, because this is an area that I find a lot of confusion. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of times it comes from what we hear in the church. I've heard a lot of pastors say, well, God called me into the ministry, right? And so what they're saying is God called me to be a pastor. And I would, I would suggest that, that confuses a lot of people because when we hear that, we think, okay, calling, that means a job. So I'm called to be a, a carpenter or I'm called to be a, a businessman or a stay-at-home mom or, or whatever that might be. I think that's a misunderstanding. What we talk about at the Institute is that calling is a more overarching thing that really comes out of who God's called you to be, who he's made you to be, and that your calling stays fairly consistent throughout your lifetime because it's based on your personality, it's based on your gifts, it's based on your passions, all of those things God gave you from the time you were born. And and as they develop, as you grow and you experience and you you try different jobs, they, they, they grow and they develop more and more, but your calling stays fairly consistent. We often talk to um, young people about calling. How do, I, how do I understand what my calling is? If it's this higher thing, it's like an umbrella that, that stretches over all the jobs I'll have, all the 
all the um, the uh, careers I might have uh, throughout my life, then how do I begin to, to find out what that is? And so I've got, I, I work with two or three programs where we work with, with kids coming out of college, and we talk to them a little bit about, first thing you have to do is understand who you are in Christ, who God made you to be. You know, take some time thinking about what are your strengths, um, what are your passions, because I would argue that your passions are given to you by God. You know, what are the things that you're really good at? And then another thing we ask them often is, do you have a life verse? Do you have one or two verses that really resonates with you? Because believe it or not, often that will point towards this, this overarching calling in your life. Let me give you my life for example. Um, I wish I, somebody had told me about this you know, many years ago, uh, because if I kind of had a sense of what my calling was, there may have been some jobs that I went and did that I would not have done. And I think that's why this is so valuable. So, for example, my life verse is Hebrews uh, 12, 1 and 2. There's four since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of, of witnesses. Let us cast aside the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run the race with perseverance that God has set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that verse has always really resonated with me. And now, you know, at, at kind of towards the end of my career, as I look back, I realize all the things, all the jobs that I did that I was really good at, that I really, really enjoyed, all were wrapped up in teaching people how to run the life, I mean, excuse me, how to run the race of life. And that, that, that verse really resonates with what God called me to do. He equipped me to be a teacher to help people, to help people be successful. And I've, been, I've trained people, I, I've run companies where I, and I've mentored people and, and hired people and shown them how to be successful. And, and so that calling, I can see the thread of that calling running back through every job that I ever did. And like I said, I wish somebody had shown me that, you know, when I was in my 20s, because it would have been very helpful. So I would encourage your listeners to kind of think through that, right? So. So, so you have this broader calling, and under that calling, you're going to have jobs, you're going to have careers, but that calling is really going to stay pretty much the same because you're pretty much the same. The way God made you is consistent through, through everything that you do. I think for help people as they begin to think about, you know, who am I in Christ? And that's really will begin to give you a clue as to what he's called you to do. It, with this overarching lifetime calling. So if you were, um, you talk about the difference between work, vocation, and calling, I think you pretty much answered the difference by what you just shared with us. But So the difference between your work and vocation, work might describe um, kind of the work that you do every day. In the- yeah, let me add one thing to that because it, it's important. One of the things I think, particularly when you read a lot of faith and work stuff, you think it's it all, everything, all the principles, all the things that we're talking about strictly apply to your vocational work, right? And, but that's not true. Let, let me give you an example. There's a great book that helps kind of uh, illustrate this idea of work, and that works not only for our vocation. All this talk about work, we can apply it to other things as well. This guy named Oz Guinness, who is, uh, wrote a book that was, that's really helpful, and I, w- I would encourage people to go find it and read it. It's called The Call. And in that book, he says that our primary calling as Christians is to become a disciple of Christ. That's our primary calling. That's a call to be, to become a disciple of Christ. And we all share that calling. But then he says, out of that calling, that primary calling, flow for what he calls secondary callings. And those secondary callings are really where we work out our faith, where we work out our, as the scripture says, we work out our salvation, fear and trembling. This is where the rubber meets the road. And he says that it's, it really, uh, the, all the work we do kind of falls into these four buckets. Our call to the family, our call to church, our call to community, and our call to vocation. So he, I, would, I would argue this that all the work we do in those four buckets, paid and unpaid, is what we call work, or really what the New Testament calls stewardship. 
that we are to be good stewards of things God has given us and go out and do the work in these four areas. And the purpose of that work is really threefold. It's to glorify God, serve the common good, and further God's kingdom in this time and this place. So we have to realize that the principles that we talk about at the Institute around work apply not only to the work we get paid to do, but also to the work we do in our homes and our families, the work we do in our communities, the work we're called to do at church. And so as you walk through life, uh, depending on what uh, part of your life you're in, if you know, those four calls are always in operation. You're always to be working in those four areas. Now, some areas you're going to spend a lot more time in than others. But nevertheless, all four of those areas are absolutely important, and the work we do in those four areas is vitally important to what God wants us to do in the world. That's great. I'm definitely going to get that book. And I heard us us speak uh, once, and he was he was awesome. So thanks for thanks for sharing that. Um, I'd also heard you speak before, and one of the things you talked about was the importance of reweaving shalom into our job. Can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite favorite topics. In fact, I'm in the process of writing a book on that right now. We hope to have out in another couple months. Um, there's a word in the Old Testament that we all know, and it's called shalom. And typically, that word is translated as peace. But unfortunately, that's a far too weak a translation for that word. Shalom, the best definition I can give you for shalom is shalom is the way God intended things to be. There was perfect shalom in the garden. On the sixth day of creation, God says it's very good. He's looking at the creation, and there's, it's perfect shalom. Everything is working exactly as he intended. And uh, so sh- shalom is it's not only peace of mind, but it, it's it's uh, it's uh, I really summed up by the word that we use a lot called flourishing. So, so shalom is really a, a biblical Old Testament concept for flourishing. Now, let me give you a couple examples. Um, around Christmas time, we always get Christmas cards that talk about Jesus as the Prince of Peace, right? That's wrong. Jesus is not the Prince of Peace. Jesus is not a prince that's going to come back and stop people from fighting. Jesus is the prince that's going to come back and make everything back to the way it was supposed to be. You see, that's what redemption is all about. Redemption is not just about my sin and your sin being forgiven. Redemption is about God putting the world back to the way it was supposed to be. And we will live in a new heaven and a new earth in the next age that will be exactly like it was supposed to be. So if you begin to think about shalom and and, and reweaving shalom, there's perfect shalom in the garden, right? And it's fascinating because on that sixth day of creation, God comes to the garden and he, and he finds Adam and Eve and says, let me tell you why I made you. Let me tell you what your job description is. Uh, this is what you're here to do. And he tells them this. He says, I want you to go do two things. I want you to go fill the earth with my redeemed images, my images. I want you to fill the earth with my redeemed images. Or not redeemed. They, they were all redeemed then. Uh, we have to say that today because when we look at today, we have to, because of the fall, all the images are broken and they need to be redeemed by Christ. So the first thing you're to do is fill the earth with my images. Second thing you're to do is to subdue the earth. Now, the word subdue is actually the Hebrew word kabosh. And in that context, it literally means to go make the earth an incredible place for human beings to flourish. And see, I would argue that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a redemptive call to a lost and forfeited calling to subdue the earth and fill it with God's images. See, we, we, in the church, we're told, well, we've got to do evangelism. That's important, and that's true. And that evangelism, family, church, you know, discipleship, all that's about filling the earth with God's redeemed images. But we have completely forgotten the other half of what we were designed to do, and that's to bring flourishing to God's creation, right? See, when sin came into the world, think of, uh, of Shalom as this incredibly beautiful tapestry with millions of threads running in and out, interwoven to, 
to create this incredibly beautiful picture of the way God wanted things to be. But when sin came into the world, that tapestry began to unravel. And we who have tasted the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and have entered into his kingdom at this time and this place are to go into the world and reweave shalom the best we can, knowing that we can never bring full shalom back to this world. That awaits Jesus' second coming. But we are called to begin to reweave shalom, to give people a glimpse of the way things are supposed to be. And we do that through our work by bringing flourishing to the communities that God has called us to serve. So that's what, that's what reweaving shalom is all about. Uh, that's powerful. And that is a whole other way of looking at in our work for sure. Um, and I guess it's kind of related to this, but I was reading about some of the core missions of the Institute, and it says that as citizens, we should promote an economic environment that not only provides us the freedom to pursue our calling That's and right. flourish and flourish in our work, but also reflects the inherent dignity of every human being. And really, that gets back to those two principles, right? The flourishing right. principle. And, and or or the the, the uh, um, to subdue the earth principle, right? Bring the flourishing, and to fill the earth with God's images. Because we were made in God's image. Here's the fascinating thing: we as Christians are called to bring flourishing, to reweave shalom in our work, uh, and that sh- and that shalom glorifies God. It serves the common good, furthers God's kingdom. But it, we are called to bring flourishing, even to some people who would never voluntarily bow a knee to Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're still images. They're broken images, but they're still images of God. And we need to treat them that way, right? And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's incredible how we need to really rethink the way we treat everybody. Um, it, it's uh, it, it completely, when you begin to think this way, it completely changes your mindset, uh, particularly to that guy at work at such a pain that, that you know, or, or the boss that's always nagging you, that, that you, know, you begin to realize they're images of God, and they need to be treated with respect and dignity. And so it really begins to change and redial the way you think about the other people that you work with uh, uh, in, in your office often, or wherever you might work. Do you have any tips for sharing the gospel in a work environment? That's a good question, and, and I'm often asked that. And and the answer I give is very different than what most people think. The the number one thing that you can do to make your witness to the gospel incredibly powerful is to do your job well. I I can't tell you how many Christians I see out there, they do a really crummy job at at their work, and, and they're really bad employees often. And yet they think that, they can do something good by going and sharing the gospel. Here, here's the biggest step I can give you. If you go do your job well, if you treat other people with respect, understanding that they're images of God, and, and you reach out to people that, that, that are having problems and help them, and, and help, help the people in your, in your work do better, help them become better employees. If you're honest, and, and, and do what you say, and don't gossip about the other people's work. If you do uh, your job in a way that brings glory to God, because really, if you read the scriptures, it says that we don't work for the boss. At our work, we work for God. He's the one we report to. And we need to think about that all the time. But if you do those things, and it's difficult, I'll admit it's difficult to do that all the time. But if you could begin to move in that direction, People will come and ask you, why are you so different? Why do you stay and work at 5 o'clock even when the boss is on vacation and the rest of us sneak out at 3.30? Why do you do that? You know, why are you honest about all these things? Why, are you, why do you do your best every day? And then, then you tell them, because I don't work for that guy in the corner office. I work for Jesus Christ. He's the one I have to answer to at the end of the day. And then you can share the gospel. And let me tell you, it will have so much more impact. Now, that doesn't mean we do good work just so that we can share the gospel. 
good work is valuable in and of itself. And I talked a lot about it. Well, you know, work is just a platform to share the gospel. Well, going to the grocery store is a platform to share the gospel. We're supposed to be prepared, as Peter says, always be prepared to give an account for the joy that's within you. So we always need to be ready. Right? We should be doing evangelism in, in, in everywhere we go. But if you want your evangelism at work to have real impact, you need to be a good employee at work. What advice would you give for dealing with that really difficult this person at work? Well, first of all, realize that, you know, they, well, first of all, you have to think, you know, if they're a believer, there's different things. There's a different strategy if they're not a believer, right? If they're not a believer, then you have to realize that that they're still images of God, right? They're still created in God's image. And you need to deal with them with dignity and respect. You need to treat them like you'd want to be treated. Because those type of people, it's so easy just to disc them and, and you know, ignore them or, or, or say bad things to, to, you, to the other employees about them. But you need to be able to, to, to think about it completely different and, and understand that, you know, they're that way probably because they're hurting about something. And God may have put you in their life to show them that there's a better way, right? There's a better way to live. There's a better way to, to operate. So and you're not going to do that by fighting with them or ignore them or being mad at them. So, so you really have to begin to change your mindset about them and then try to be open to letting the Holy Spirit lead you in, into what to say to them and how to act to them. Because uh, there's going to be different. I mean, there's no set way to approach every you know, problematic person. And to be quite honest with you, there's some problematic people that, that you're not going to be able to help. And with those people, it's just best to, uh, to do the best you can. I, I had a young man I was talking to that day. He was talking to me about he, had a really, he has a really terrible boss. And he was, he was going on and on. He said, what can I do to fix him? You know, how can I fix this problem? And I said, you know, the solution may be to find another job. And sometimes that is the solution, right? And so you have to be open to that. But you have, also have to be open to staying there trying to make the situation better, uh, once again, when you get in these difficult situations, you really need to pray, you need to read the scriptures, and ask God to give you guidance on how to work with people like that. Because, I listen, I've had them in my life all the time. It's very frustrating, and uh, sometimes we want to walk away when God wants us to hang in there. Sometimes I've had the problem, I've hung in there too long when God wants me to walk away. So I think it, the primary thing is be open to God's leading on how to deal with them, and really see them as someone that needs help. Do you have any suggestions for people like me who've got a really long commute, how to make the most of yeah. our, our drive time? Yeah, I, I feel your pain, pain brother. I, I, I've got about an hour commute myself every day. I'm in Washington, D.C. We have some of the worst traffic in the world, and even when the traffic's not too bad, it's 45 minutes. Um, First thing you need to do is, is get set up where you can listen to something beside the radio, right? I, the radio, talk radio, the music's on the radio, uh, uh, even the news it, it is so designed uh, to just drag you down. It doesn't lift you up. It doesn't really edify you. It doesn't equip you to do what God wants you to do. So uh, I, I'll suggest two or three things that I do. I, you know, sometimes I listen to scripture. Uh, I have... Um, the radio in my car, I kind of hacked into my stereo so I can hook it to my phone. So, so I've got the scripture on my phone, and sometimes I listen to that. Sometimes I listen to podcasts like this that are very positive and, and give me ideas on how to, how to be a better employer or a better uh, worker, to, to be better at what I do, uh, to, to help me think through how I can be uh, uh, better with, with, the, with the tools and the and opportunities and, and the gifts God has given me. Uh, lots of books. I read books all the time. I download books from audible.com. Just, I mean, there's so much good stuff out there to listen to that will edify you, that will lift up your, your spirit and equip you to be the person God wants you to be. Don't waste the time listening to, uh, to, to sports radio or something like that. You know, but that would be my only suggestion. Sounds good. Um, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap this up? 
Well, just one. I think we don't realize what an incredible opportunity God has given us to be men and women that change the world through our work. Right? Unfortunately, the church has lost the vision of this, but if you go back and look at history, over the last 2,000 years, particularly in Western civilization, almost every good thing that's been done, and this has all been written out of the history books, interestingly enough, but almost every good thing that was done, whether we're starting schools, uh, universities, teaching kids to read, both men and women, uh, whether it was uh, building the hospitals, uh, coming up with cures for sicknesses, um, great art, great music, uh, abolishing slavery, you know, uh, um, women's rights, I mean, all those things, almost every single good thing that's been done over the last 2,000 years was done by Christians who understood the call on their life was to go out into the world, use the talents and gifts God had given them to reweave shalom, to bring flourishing to the communities God had called them to serve. And yet over the last 100 years, we in the church have completely forgotten about that. We don't understand that our work is a platform that God has given us to bring his grace and his flourishing to the communities and to the people around us who desperately need it. And it not only gives glory to God, but it makes the world a better place. It brings a little bit of a taste of shalom for people who desperately need it. And so the last thought is, you know, think about what you're going to do tomorrow, whether it's work in your home, in your church, in your community, or at your job. And think about how God can use you to make a difference, to bring flourishing to the communities that he's called you to be of service to. And if you do that, you'll fulfill what uh, one of my other favorite verses, and I'll end with this, Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles of Babylon. These are the, these are the children of Israel in the Old Testament that were taken off to Babylon because of, of Israel's sins and rebellion against God. And he tells them, he says, work for the peace and the prosperity of the city that have carried you into exile. Because if it prospers, if it has prosperity, you too will prosper. If you go look at that, it literally says, work for the shalom of the city that I've called you in exile. Because if it has shalom, you too will have shalom. If you will have a sense in your life of the way things are supposed to be, this incredible feeling of shalom, if you want to experience God's blessing on your life, the way you do that is by bringing blessing to other people. God bless you. Thank you for having me on. This has been a blast. Hey, Hugh, uh, before you go, um, if anyone wants to learn more about you or even contact you, um, how would you recommend they go about doing that? Yes, go on, the, go on the Internet and go to our website. It's www.tifwe.org. So tifwe.org. Or if you just Google faith, work, economics, it'll come up. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks for your time, Hugh. You're welcome. God bless you. You too. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Um, Look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, don't forget our prayer line if you want to leave a comment about this or any other episode or ask for prayer or offer prayer to someone else. Uh, The number is 641-715-3900, extension 524-645-POUND. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.